Augusta and Queen Sylvia with Crown Princess Victoria and Prince Daniel have arrived. As well as Carl Henry Kelden and Lars Hengelsten took their seats. in the major by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart which is the uh, music that is played when the laureates enter the stage rises for the laureates. First in line is Gérard Mouhou, physics laureate, followed by his physics colleague laureate Donna Strickland. Francis Arnold, one of this year's chemistry laureates, with George Smith and Sir Gregory Winter by her side to the right, also chemistry laureate. And then we have James Allison and Tazuko Honyo, this year's medicine laureate and to the far right there we have William Nordhaus and Paul Romer economics
All in all, 12 laureates this year, including the Peace Laureates, Denis McQuigua and Nadia Murad, who earlier today received the Peace Prize in Oslo. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, esteemed Nobel laureates, ladies and gentlemen, Carl Henry Kildin, on Chairman behalf of the, of the Nobel board. Foundation, <clears throat> it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this year's Nobel Prize Award Ceremony. In particular, I would like to welcome the Nobel laureates and their families to this ceremony. Earlier today in Oslo, Denis Mukwege and Nadia Murad were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for their efforts to end the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war and armed conflict. Through this prize, the Norwegian Nobel Committee reminds us that human rights must include also rights of women. Too often, women have been violated in conflicts as a way of disrupting a society. Words cannot describe the horrors that Nadia Murad has lived through, but we should be grateful that she has decided to share her story with us as a call for action. Dr. Denis McQuege has likewise shown exceptional courage and persistence when he, at great personal risk, has alleviated the suffering of so many women in the Congo. Alfred Nobel's vision was to reward those who have made the greatest benefit to humankind in science, literature, and peace, and thereby have contributed to a better world. Undoubtedly, the world has, in many ways, become a better place since the end of the 19th century when Alfred Nobel lived. However, in recent years, we have unfortunately seen new dangerous tendencies on the rise. While the Paris Agreement is a sign that the question of global warming is taken seriously, it is deeply worrying that influential world leaders are denying the connection, despite of overwhelming scientific evidence, between our lifestyle and climate change, and preventing the necessary actions from being taken. Also in other fields, we see that facts, observations, and information are distorted or ignored. We see how nationalism and isolationism are increasing, with restrictions in trade, cultural exchange, and a movement across borders. Together, this endangers the world as we know it. Science offers a counter-movement to the isolationistic and fact-resistant tendencies we see. It has no borders, and scientists often move between countries. Science is our time's lingua franca and can form bridges between countries and cultures. The importance of research is therefore not only limited to the generation of new knowledge, but it serves a more general role, providing a common ground for interactions between people all over the world. Moreover, modern science does not only involve skeptical inquiry, but is also often led by an ethos of openness and tolerance. Today, we do not only celebrate the Nobel Prize. It is also 70 years ago that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the United Nations. And 50 years since René Cassin received the Nobel Peace Prize for his work with the Declaration. This serves to remind us that one of the reasons that modern society has progressed is that it has created a set of institutions and instruments that formalize this progress. Human rights is one of these, as is science and democracy. But again, we cannot take these institutions and instruments for granted. We are all aware of the increasing questioning of universal human rights freedom of speech, and academic independence, all values closely connected with what the Nobel Prize stands for. This is deeply troubling, since we risk a regression to a time before they existed, to a time ruled by ignorance, prejudice, and barbarism. The now more than 900 Nobel laureates and their achievements are a source of inspiration to us all. 
via well-visited museums in Stockholm and Oslo, various events in different countries, and through our digital channels with millions of followers, we are reaching out to all over the globe to tell their stories. To further enhance our outreach activities, we have been working hard with support from the Erling Passion Family Foundation and the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation and many other donors to achieve a Nobel Center in the heart of Stockholm. We would like to take this opportunity to thank them, as well as the architects, David Chipperfield and Christoph Felger, for their support and commitment. Despite the setback we now have had with the decisions taken by the new ruling majority in Stockholm, we are prepared to continue to work for this idea. It is simply too good to be stopped. However, given what has happened, we have to be clear. If Stockholm is going to get a Nobel Center, strong, concrete and reliable support from the city of Stockholm, as well as from the government of Sweden, will be needed. Scientific breakthroughs of the kind we honor today are fostered by creating strong environments and by giving excellent scientists freedom, independence, and long-term funding. Such creative milieus become fertile for new ideas through being open to a diversity of skills, experiences, and cultural backgrounds, and through letting young scientists speak their mind. In strong scientific environments, the focus is often on basic research, that is, curiosity-driven research, which does not aim at solving a practical problem, but only aims at answering interesting and important questions. Max Planck, the 1918 Nobel laureate in physics, went so far as to say, scientific discovery and scientific knowledge have been achieved only by those who have gone in pursuit of it without any practical purpose whatsoever in view. Remarkably, however, many basic research discoveries have later on been proven to have practical usefulness, often in unexpected areas. In this way, advances in basic science becomes part of the progress that Alfred Nobel wished to see. The production of new knowledge just thus joins the struggle for human rights in these awards, which we hope can inspire, in particular young people, to make even more remarkable contributions for the benefit of humankind. Thank you for listening, and once again, most welcome to this year's Nobel Prize Award Ceremony. said Carl Henrik Heldin, chairman of the board of the Nobel Foundation, before the first prizes are to be handed over by His Majesty the King. And the first laureate to receive it will be Gérard Moreau. But first, some music by Claude Debussy, French composer.
Claude Debussy's Claire de Lune, perhaps especially uh, appreciated by this year's physics laureate, Gérard Moreau, also from France, born in 1944 in Albertville, who at the time of affiliation worked at Ecole Polytechnique in Palaiso in France. And a speech now Eders about Majestät, this prize. Eders Kungliga Högheter, ärade Nobelpristagare, mina damer och herrar. Ladies and gentlemen. Sunlight is essential to life on Earth. We are getting better and better at harnessing its energy. We also use light in many other ways, today often employing a laser as the light source. Two examples, lasers in everyday use are barcode readers and laser pointers. This year's Nobel Prize in Physics honors two inventions in laser physics that have led to heart-breaking ways of using light. These methods have given us light-based tools with applications in medicine and other fields. Arthur Ashkin, Arthur Ashkin is being rewarded for the invention of optical tweezers and their application to biological systems. This invention is based on the ability of light to exert a force on matter known as radiation pressure. The possibility of using light via this force to move physical objects may make one think of Star Trek and tractor beams and sound like pure science fiction. Of course, we can feel that sunbeams carry energy, they make us warm, but we cannot feel any small push. The force of this sunlight is too weak to do so. The starting point that led Ashkin to this optical tweezer was an experiment aimed at showing that the radiation pressure in an intense laser beam is actually strong enough to move microscopic particles. As it turned out, laser light could not only move such particles, but could also be made to grab them by focusing the beam with the help of a lens. This marked the birth of the optical tweezers, an elegant tool that has gained a broad range of applications and that lets us hold on to and move objects such as living cells without touching them. Ashkin's method has been successfully used to investigate various components of biological cells, among other things providing us with knowledge about the mechanics of tiny molecular motors that perform vital work inside these cells. Gérard Moreau and Donna Strickland are being rewarded for an invention called Chirped Pulse Amplification, or CPA. This is a method for creating extremely intense short pulses of laser light. Efforts to create more intense laser pulses have been underway since the first laser was built in 1960. But by the mid-1980s, these experiments had reached an impasse. Since the intensity of the laser light destroyed the amplifying material itself, using their CPA technique, Mohu and Strickland were able to get around their, this limitation. The strategy was simple and elegant. First, stretch out the laser pulse in time, thereby reducing its intensity and allowing it to be amplified. Finally, compress the pulse again to its original length of time, but now with much higher intensity. This method changed the landscape of research about high-intensity lasers from something that had been carried out in a few large laboratories to something that could be done in many places around the world, leading to a powerful search in development work. 
The pursuit of shorter and shorter pulses has enabled researchers to move closer to the attosecond level, which means one billionth of a billionth of a second. This opens the way for studying the movements of electrons in atoms and molecules. Numerous applications of laser pulses are being made possible by the CPA technique. One example is eye surgery for correcting nearsightedness, in which laser pulses serve as ultra-precision surgical tool. Dr. Ashkin, Professor Muru, Professor Strickland, you have been awarded the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics for your groundbreaking inventions in the field of laser physics. On behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, it's my honor and great pleasure to convey to you our warmest congratulations. I now ask you to step forward to receive your Nobel Prizes from the hands of His Majesty the King. I welcome Professor Michael Ashkin to receive the prize on behalf of his father, Arthur Ashkin. That was the presentation speech by Professor Anders Irbeck, member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. One wonder was what, what the king might be saying now. Perhaps say hello to your father. He's probably watching this. Michael Ashkin, son of Arthur Ashkin, receiving this year's physics prize. Michael Ashkin, himself a professor uh, of arts. Gérard Moreau, born in France, also receives his prize. Theo Strickland, born in 1959 in Ontario, Canada, receives her part of the 2018 Nobel Physics Prize. Some music by Charles T. Griffiths. We will hear soloist Christina Nilsson and the Stockholm, the Royal Stockholm Philharmonic Orchestra. The piece is the Lament of Ian the Proud from the three poems of Fiona MacLeod.
after that musical interlude, the prize award ceremony will continue with a presentation of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Speech by Professor Sara Snogrup Linse, who is a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and member of the Nobel Committee for Chemistry. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, esteemed Nobel laureates, ladies and gentlemen, we humans believe we know everything. Sometimes it may be more fruitful to acknowledge our incompetence and trust the superior performance of Mother Nature. An element of chance can work wonders in the lab. Just like in everyday life, the level of success may be higher if one allows oneself the luxury of good luck. Evolution has over a billion of years adapted and refined the chemistry of life. This allows various organisms to coexist and thrive in all sorts of possible and seemingly impossible environments. In nature, evolution has no plan. Changes that make an organism better adapted to its environment increase the chances for survival and new improvement can be added over generations to come. Frances Arnold had a defined plan when she set up directed evolution in her laboratory. She wanted to make a greener chemical industry and produce biofuels in a sustainable way. Frances Arnold harnessed the power of evolution and made it a versatile tool for improving nature's own catalysts and enzymes. She also made it possible to create new biocatalysts that can speed up reactions not seen in nature. Time after time, through smart combinations of knowledge and chance, she created enzymes that are for the greatest benefit of humankind. The proteins in nature can also make wonders by interacting and intriguing. George Smith developed a method to create very large collections of similar proteins and then using a molecular bait he could fish out the members of the collection that were most strongly attracted to the bait. He constructed his method so that every protein carries with it the recipe for its own production. This feature makes it easy to make new copies of the best proteins and engage them in a tighter competition for the bait. Gregory Winter sharpened the fishing tools for the development of pharmaceuticals. Antibodies are large and complex molecules. But Winter chose to work with a small fragment that carries all the variations seen among natural antibodies. The result became a powerful method for deriving new antibodies for diagnostics and treatment. Antibodies with high precision can adhere strongly and persistently to other molecules or cell surfaces to facilitate or interfere with their duties. Francis Arnold, Gregory Smith, George Smith, sorry, and Gregory Winter. Your work has led to the development of enzymes for greener chemistry and antibodies that save lives. That's a truly great achievement. On behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, I wish to convey to you our warmest congratulations. May I now ask you to step forward and receive your Nobel Prizes from the hands of His Majesty, the King. First, to receive the prize is Francis Arnold of the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, United States, who receives one half of this year's chemistry prize for the direct evolution of enzymes. The other half is jointly awarded to George Smith of University of Missouri, Missouri 
in the United States. It's jointly with Sir Gregory Winter of the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology at Cambridge, UK, for the phage display of peptides and antibodies. some more music. The Allegretto Amorevole from the Symphony in C minor by composer Alice Mary Smith.
chemistry laureate Frances Arnold. Her cancer was actually one of she was one of the first to have it cured by his by her uh, laureate colleague Gregory Winter's method. And uh, this year's medicine prize is definitely about cancer therapy. Now we will hear the presentation speech by Klaus Schärre. Cancer, cancer, one of the greatest scourges of humanity, is caused by the uncontrolled proliferation of diseased cells that can spread in the body and form metastasis. Cancer therapy has been based on three pillars, surgery, radiotherapy, and drugs that attack cancer cells. Today, more than two-thirds of cancers are cured, but the disease still claims millions of lives every year. There's a great need for new forms of therapy, and for a long time, researchers have pinned their hopes on the possibility of utilizing our immune system, which normally protects us against infections. The immune system is based on a diversified array of instruments in the form of various cells and molecules. Each of them has its own special sound and technical requirements to get them to work, a bit like the instruments in the orchestra here today. The fundamental task of the immune system is to distinguish between foreign cells and react against them, and the body's own cells, which it must leave in peace. T-cells, the kind of white blood cells that act, among other things, as killer cells, use a special instrument called a receptor to identify cancer cells as foreign. By the 90s, cancer immunology researchers had shown that T-cells will then react, but unfortunately in a much too timid way. Let's ask the orchestra to illustrate. Beautiful and clear, but alas, so short, slow, and weak. Playing andante and pianissimo was not enough to eliminate cancer cells. This year's Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine goes to two researchers who discovered how we can release the brakes that hold back the immune system, thereby mobilizing it for cancer therapy. Both laureates are immunologists, but neither was actually a cancer researcher from the beginning. This story therefore illustrates something important, the unexpected benefits of basic research. In the mid-90s, Jim Allison was working in a field of research that identified gas pedals that amplify the reaction of T cells, but also a brake pedal that weakened it. He tested the very bold idea of releasing the brake pedal by using antibodies to trigger T-cell reactions against cancer. He began by curing cancer in mice. Then he worked step by step to develop this therapy for humans. He called it checkpoint inhibition. In the first clinical studies of a malignant melanoma, some patients responded dramatically. Even in patients with a disease all over their bodies, the metastasis shrank away and disappeared. Tascohonio had already discovered a new molecule on T cells in the early 90s. Through many years of systematic work, he was able to show that it serves as another breaking mechanism in the immune system. Inspired by Allison, he showed that blocking this break also triggered attacks on cancer cells in mice, and that it worked in a new way. Konya suggested that his might be developed into a powerful cancer therapy. Clinical researchers were later able to confirm his hypothesis. This form of checkpoint inhibition leads to responses in more patients and also works against additional forms of cancer. Let's get a preview of how the immune system orchestra sounds when we release the brakes. That's the way to go. 
Allegro e Fortissimo. Allegro e Fortissimo. That was a bit different, the way it should sound. By orchestrating the immune system in the right way, it has proved possible to control or eliminate the disease in tens of thousands of patients. Many are still tumor-free and after more than five years. This new pillar of cancer therapy is already solid, and the Laureus discoveries have inspired a whole new field of research. Like the Carmen Overture, it promises an exciting future. <coughs> Professors Allison and Honjo, your groundbreaking research has added a fourth pillar in cancer therapy. It represents a new paradigm for treatment, not directly targeting the cancer cells, but rather releasing the brakes of the immune system. Your seminal discoveries constitute a landmark in the fight against cancer for the benefit of numerous patients and all humankind. On behalf of the Nobel Assembly at Karolinska Institute, I wish to convey to you our warmest congratulations. May I now ask you to step forward to receive the Nobel Prize from the hands of His Majesty the King. First, James Allison, you receive half of the prize. Allison of the University of Texas in the United States. half of the prize to Tasco Honyo at the Kyoto University in Kyoto, Japan. Not the Carmen Overture, but we will hear Dich Teure Halle, Elizabeth's greeting from Panhauser by Richard Wagner. Once again with soloist Christina Nilsson.
Eders majestäter, eders kungliga högheter, ärade pristagare, mina damer och herrar. Årets ekonomipris handlar om ekonomisk tillväxt på lång sikt. Och so, is economic growth exciting? Do a few percent of growth here or there really matter? And anyway, in the long run, we're all dead. Economic growth has been almost non-existent throughout most of human history. But a couple of centuries ago, this began to change. My grandfather, Arne, was born in 1900 and saw the world around him change radically during the course of his long life. Over the decades and centuries, a few percent of growth each year can revolutionize our standard of living. But growth does not occur everywhere. It does not just arrive like manna from heaven, given equally to everyone on earth. Sometimes it can even go backwards so that living standards actually fall. Why is this? What drives growth? How long can it continue? And can we deal with increasingly obvious downsides of growth? Greenhouse gas emissions are changing for the first time in our history, the climate of our entire world. Growth and new technology have given humankind the power to reshape our living conditions, and not just for us, but for all life on the planet. How should we use this power in a way that doesn't risk the welfare of future generations? These are thought-provoking questions, and the answers are absolutely vital. Once one starts to think about them, it's hard to think about anything else. This year's laureates, William Nordhaus and Paul Romer, have given us entirely new tools for investigating fundamental questions about the causes and consequences of growth. Paul Romer laid the foundation of what we now call endogenous growth theory. This is new ideas as motors for growth, but its focus is not on scientific progress like written language and mathematics or revolutionary inventions like the compass and printing press. Of course, uh, these ideas are amazingly important, but we were not enough to start a sustained growth. Instead, Romer's theory focuses on how economic motivation drives a continual flow of new ideas that are created by entrepreneurs and businesses. But ideas are not like other goods. Many people can use one and the same idea at the same time. Still, the problem is that if an idea is freely available to anyone, then you can't earn money from it. Roma's growth theory shows how intelligent market regulation, a patent system, creates the right conditions for sustained global growth. William Nordhaus realized that a broad analysis of climate change and what to do about it requires us to bring together insights from physics, chemistry and economics. This was how he built the first integrated assessment model for global warming. It describes how economic activity causes greenhouse gas emissions, how these gases spread through the atmosphere, how this changes the climate and to close to circle, how to climate influences the economy and welfare now and in the future. Nordhaus's model explains the best way for us to approach the climate problem, namely by putting a price on emissions, such as through a carbon tax. High enough emissions prices also steer technological development towards more sustainable power provision, linking together the contributions of Nordhaus with those of Romer. It is probably in human nature to think about and plan for the future, even after our own lives have ended. This is a good thing, because if we do not think about our future, we cannot have one. Dear Professor Nordhaus, dear Professor Romer, your research has given us deep insights into the causes and consequences of climate change and technological innovation. The tools you have developed broaden the scope of economic analysis 
allowing us to think about the future in new and better ways. It's an honor and a privilege to convey to you, on behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, our warmest congratulations. I now ask you to receive your prizes from His Majesty the King. The Economics Prize was not uh, originally in the will of Alfred Nobel. It was established in 1968, celebrating 50 years then. But this is the 49th time it's been given to scientists within economics. First to receive it is William Nordhaus at Yale, of Yale University. For his DICE model, his model that makes it possible to put a price on climate change. And Paul Romer, a guru within research of economic growth, affiliated at the New York University. This was the last prize awarded today, since there is no literature prize this year, due to the uh, problems in the Swedish Academy, the Literature Awarding Institution. So hereby we end the 2018 Nobel Prize Award Ceremony with the Swedish National Anthem. Festivity March by Hugo Aldea, which is played while the guests are leaving the auditorium with the royal family. Members of the Swedish government and other guests of honor. of honor that will take place at the table of honor at the uh, banquet that begins in a little bit more than an hour. So the uh, 1500 guests here are going out to buses and cabs driving downtown to the Stockholm. City Hall, where the banquet will take place. Yes, laureates, James Allison, Tesco Honyo, Arthur Ashkin, Gérard Moreau, Donna Strickland, Francis Arnold, George Smith, Sir Gregory Winter, William Nordhaus, Paul Romer, and Peace Laureates that were awarded earlier in Oslo, Denis McQuaggie and Nadia Morad. 
Thank you from Stockholm.